What's up, y'all? This is CNQ. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Like and share. I'm coming at you with a report on the death of Dr. Francis Press Wilson. For those of you who don't know who she was, she was born Francis Luella Cress in Chicago, Illinois on March 18, 1935. She was a third generation physician, started with her grandfather, her father, and then herself after receiving her medical degree in psychiatry at Howard University in 1962. Her mother was a school teacher. Now, during her fellowship at Howard in 1967, she received an inner calling to go to what she referred to as a Black Power Committee meeting. But anyway, when I'm training in psychiatry and looking for the answer to be an effective psychiatrist with black people, looking for the answer to racism. And I remember attending a black power committee meeting. And as a matter of fact, I was doing a fellowship in child psychiatry at that point. And I would get a voice. And you know, if you get a voice in here, you need to see a psychiatrist. If you get a voice in here, I think that's God talking to you. And the voice would say, and I would be writing up cases at the end of the day, and the voice would say, go to a Black Power Committee meeting. You know, just quietly, it wasn't frightening. So when ministers say they get a call, and I kind of know what they mean. <laughs> And so this would happen over and over and over again. Again, it was subtle, very subtle, nothing to shake you up or anything, because I didn't go to meetings. And so I finally went to a Black Power Committee meeting. And after the meeting, people were sitting in somebody's apartment eating African food. And a gentleman was on the other side of the room. And I heard this man say, Mind you, I'm looking for further answers to racism. And I hear this gentleman over there in the other corner saying racism is a system. And it's like my mind, you know, I'm looking for, you know, they say when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so I started talking to this person. The gentleman's name was Neely Fuller Jr. He wasn't a college professor. He was a guard at the Bureau of Engraving in the District of Columbia, where they print the money. After learning the United Independent Compensatory Code from its founder, Neely Fuller Jr., she proclaimed that she and all other people classified as non-white were in fact victims of racism white supremacy. It was after having many meetings with Neely Fuller that Wilson decided, as a psychiatrist, she needed to know why racism white supremacy was a system. Her hypothesis to that why is the Crest Theory of Color Confrontation, which she published in the ISIS paper. Essentially, her theory says that racism white supremacy is a survival mechanism put in place to prevent what she referred to as white genetic annihilation, which basically means removing white people from the planet through sexual intercourse with non-white people. She's best known for her lectures on racism, white supremacy, and her book, The ISIS Papers. On page four, she says, to take Fuller's account a step further, it should be noted that in the majority of instances, any neurotic drive for superiority usually is founded upon a deep and pervading sense of inadequacy and inferiority. Is it not true that white people represent in numerical terms a very small minority of the world's people? And more profoundly, is not white itself the very absence of any ability to produce color? I reason then that the quality of whiteness is indeed a genetic inadequacy 
or relative genetic deficiency state based upon the genetic inability to produce the skin pigments of melanin, which is responsible for all skin color. The vast majority of the world's people are not so afflicted, which suggests that color is normal for human beings and color absence is abnormal. Additionally, this state of color absence acts always as a genetic recessive to the dominant genetic factor of color production. Color always annihilates, phenotypically and genetically speaking, the non-color, white. Black people possess the greatest color potential, with brown, red, and yellow peoples possessing lesser quantities, respectively. This is the genetic and psychological basis for the Crest theory of color confrontation and racism white supremacy. Her theory can be supported by the mantra of the unsophisticated racist white supremacists, aka the white nationalists and or others who rally for the survival of the so-called white race. 14 words is a reference to a well-known white supremacist slogan, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. It can be used to refer to a different 14 word slogan, because the beauty of the white Aryan woman must not perish from the earth. Origin, both slogans were coined by David Lane, convicted member of the white supremacist terrorist organization The Order, and publicized through the efforts of the now defunct 14 word press which helped popularize it and other writings of Lane. The first slogan is claimed to have been inspired by a statement, 88 words in length from Volume 1, Chapter 8 of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. What we must fight for is to safeguard the existence and reproduction of our race and our people, the sustenance of our children and the purity of our blood, the freedom and independence of the fatherland, so that our people may mature for the fulfillment of the mission allotted it by the Creator of the Universe. Every thought and every idea, every doctrine and all knowledge, must serve this purpose and everything must be examined from this point of view and used or rejected according to its utility. Dr. Wilson died on Saturday, January 2nd, 2016. It was an attempt at gentrification to kill Dr. Wilson and I can prove it based on her own reports plus additional evidence. I define gentrification to mean the unjust removal of one or more non-white persons from their habitat to make space for one or more white persons. So what happened? On Thursday, December 31st, 2015, Dr. Wilson was found unconscious in bed. She suffered from two major strokes and was placed on machine support. She never regained consciousness. In his January 5th, 2016 interview presented on Black News 101 by Sonetta Studios, I heard Mr. Anthony Broder say for us to please help honor her family by not spreading or participating in any conspiracy theories about her death. I knew exactly what he meant because these days every time one of our conscious brothers or sisters passes away, it's always some kind of conspiracy attached to their death. Some victims make the claim that they were killed because of the work they did. This is not logical in this case because Dr. Welsing labored for 40 plus years and nothing happened to her. They had plenty of opportunity to kill her way before now. Why wait until she was 80 years old? At that time I agreed with Mr. Broder until I heard this. We don't want to look at a glaring reality like what takes place in Washington is leading what takes place all across the country so-called. In every major city, my hometown is Chicago, gentrification is taking place. I have two sisters living there. One lives in the area of the University of Chicago. She talks about the gentrification and the attitudes on the part of the people who classify themselves as white, almost, well, why are you still here? You know, I'm struggling with my own house. A white school builds a playground next to my home where I've lived for 43 years. Uh, trying to talk, push talk, me talk right out there, by noise harassment. Right. Well, I'll let you talk about that. And we also got some folks who want to speak to you about this gentrification. What we, and what can we do about it? 
800-450-7876. Radio in the AM. The number one morning show. The number one on everybody list. Carl Nelson on 1450 WOL. Thank you for rolling this morning. I'm Dr. Francis Wilson at 26 minutes after the hour. Folks, uh, and I posted those two articles that uh, Dr. Wilson mentioned the, uh, in, the, in the post, the one about being hard to, as a black person to live in the district, and two, the other one about the merchants in Georgetown basically u- uh, using an app to racially profile uh, suspects when they come into their stores. But before we left for the, the break, Dr. Wilson, you were telling us about the personal attack on, on you, on where you've lived by a school nearby. I'll let you finish up that story for us. Okay, well, this has been going on for, this is going into the sixth year that a school playground, a predominant, a white school, put a playground next to my home with and refused to follow, they were supposed to be 15 feet from my property line and a buffer of trees, and they built a playground right up to my fence. I have something like 30 balls, bats, frisbees that have come onto my property, but the noise is horrendous. And see, there's no way in the world that a black person would be able to cause this kind of harassment attack on white people in the District of Columbia. But white people can do it to a black person. And this is what this article is talking about. What people who classify themselves as white, tragically, are doing to black people, and apparently it is being allowed. Now this is significant, because I first learned of this conflict when Dr. Wilson was interviewed by the Final Call newspaper on April 15, 2013. It was called Palestine on the Potomac, And it led me to post an article on April 19, 2013 on my blog, Counter Racism Now, with a link to a petition started by the Dr. Francis Crest Wilson Community Support Collective in order to pressure the Washington, D.C. Board of Zoning Adjustment, also known as the BZA, to enforce its mandate against this school's administrators. I'm going to show you that not only did this school's administrators violate that mandate, but in addition, that they made her situation worse. Dr. Welsing and her lawyer reported to the BZA in September 20th, 2012. Baseball bat, uh, those kind of objects. And, and, and of course, uh, if you're sitting in your backyard and you notice that these objects are in your yard, I mean, it, it, it may cause you to be somewhat anxious about the fact that is it going to come into your yard at a time when you're sitting back there trying to read or enjoy yourself? But of course, her situation is that she really can't go outside her house at the time that the students are on the lot because of the noise itself. So, no matter, no matter how you look at it, she has alleged from the very beginning that her only concern was noise and that the very thing that was to protect her from the noise, which was these mature trees, uh, have been have been destroyed. They were destroyed ab initio from the very from the very onset of the uh, construction. And as a result, she has had no protection. And over a period the period of two years now that this has been going on, it has caused her some some serious health problems. Um, we differ with the with the with the school's uh, contention that it is in compliance with the board order because the way we read the September 26, 2011 report of investigation is that the issue of noise has not been in fact resolved and that the issue of the, the buffer area is inconclusive because the fact that the the plan that was approved the architectural plan that was approved by the board really does not show uh, the dimensions of the buffer zone. And uh, I think I think that's that's the essence of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Hunter was to be here to testify, but because of a, of a, of a commitment that he has uh, to his practice, he can't he cannot be here. Um, but 
we had put in the we had put in the evidence at the time that that Dr. Wilson made her complaint, and and that that matter has not been resolved because your office, uh, the offices of, of, of zoning, uh, has referred the matter to the uh, Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs over the issue of enforcement. And from my understanding, the Office of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. Uh, the Office of Zoning Administrator within the Office of Community, uh, Department of Community and, and uh, Consumer and Regulatory Affairs has had a number of meetings, uh, staff meetings, in an effort to determine what exactly to do. And for whatever reason, we've had no report that, that anything has been done. But from the, the last thing that we heard uh, was in approximately May or June of this year when they had they stated they had taken the matter under advisement. But your staff, uh, Mr. Nero and a woman named Tracy Rose Whitten, they in fact came out to Dr. Wilson's property to investigate the complaint and the report that they issued did say that there was an issue with the noise and with the buffer zone. And on the basis of that, that was referred to DCRA for enforcement. The, the name of the article is School Harassment Makes Home Palestine on the Potomac. I'm quoting Dr. Wilson. They, GPDS, were supposed to assure that I had protection from the noise. To make a long story short, this has never happened and there has never been protection from the noise. So it's yelling and screaming that goes on normally on a playground, but whether this should be allowed to go on immediately adjacent to someone's home so that I have to leave my home with a headache to get away from the noise, this is patently wrong. I have been complaining about it and there has been no solution to this problem. The playground opened in 2010 and this is going on into the third year of the program operation. My health has been neg negatively impacted. My doctors have told me I could have a heart attack or a stroke based on what is happening to my cardiac functioning. This is just patently wrong. It says for more than 30, 40 years, well-known psychiatrist and author Dr. Frances Cress Welsing has lived peacefully in her home in Upper Northwest Washington. That is except for the last three years when she has been subjected to bullying and noise harassment by the Jewish primary day school next door, which she believes wants to drive her out of the neighborhood so they can seize her property and expand their campus. There's one, one thing I did see about it, and that is, is that subsequent to, to, to the, as a reason, this application, the current application is predicated upon the fact that the Jewish Primary Day School has acquired the property immediately to the south of Dr. Wilson, so that she is now the only neighbor left on that block. And the configuration of the property is that although the house is technically on the corner, uh, and I think Dr. Phillips owned that house, uh, which was at the corner of 16th and Missouri, the config, 16th and Military Road, the configuration of the property is that in fact, that property's backyard wraps behind Dr. Welsing's property, so that it actually borders Dr. Welsing's property on both the south and on the east. And there is now a playground area to the south of her property also. Kind of V-shaped. Yes. I mean, I'm sorry, to the, to the, there's a playground area to the east and to the north, so that she's kind of boxed in. Does the board have any questions? Of, of uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just following the question, um, trying to get the lay of the land here with the property, uh, Mr. Davis, does um, Dr. Welsing have a fence surrounding her property? She has a fence on the on the on the, uh, on the north border. Yes. And can you describe the type of fence? It's a long wood, eight foot tall fence. Okay, thank you. Any question? Uh, 
turn to the applicant for questions. I have none. Thank you. 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 Th
and he too heard what Broder said and attempted to persuade me not to do this out of respect for Broder being an elder and all. Broder may not have been aware that this was going on, but seeing how he resided in D.C. and stated in his interview that he would constantly check on Dr. Wilson, he should have definitely known about this incident. I'm not saying this to say that he did anything incorrect. Only he knows why he said what he said. And the blame always goes to the powers that be, not another victim. I realize that not to present this information to you would be unjust because what happened to Dr. Wilson is a prime example of what racism white supremacy is and how it works, especially in regards to gentrification. By presenting this information, I suspect that I'm honoring her because it started with information that she herself revealed. I will use her words to show you what happened to her And, and that it does appear to be mistreatment by some of the administrators of the school. According to Dr. Welsing, some racist suspects amongst the administration of the Jewish Primary Day School of Washington, D.C. conspired to force her to move from her house for 40 years, and I suspect that they killed her in the process. So let's start from the beginning. In 2006, JPDS acquired the property from Dr. Welsing's dead next door neighbor and announced plans to construct a playground on that site. In 2007, hearings were held with Dr. Welsing, JPDS, and the DC Board of Zoning and Adjustment about her right to noise protection. The BZA ruled in Dr. Welsing's favor, ordering JPDS to make, and I quote, the playground's construction include a 15-foot buffer zone between the edge of the playground and the retention of a stand of 40 foot tall trees to serve as a sound buffer to Dr. Wilson's property. According to Dr. Wilson's attorney, JPDS stated in its 2007 application that the six 40 foot tall evergreen trees along the north side of Dr. Wilson's property would help reduce the noise and they would add additional trees to fill in the spacing between the trees in an effort to improve the noise reduction. In 2010, JPDS constructed the playground and removed the six evergreen trees and did not install adequate noise protection for Dr. Wilson. Uh, and this, these, these uh, BZA uh, transcripts can be found on counterracismnow.com. I posted them there uh, in April, on April 19th, 2013. Now it states in the transcript that September 2012, Dr. S Dr. Wilson said, When I woke up one morning and heard bulldozers and I went to my proper little window and saw that these big huge trees were being bulldozed, I immediately called the school and was told that wasn't supposed to happen, but they were gone. Now, I want you to imagine. Now, Dr. Welsing, uh, according to the information that we have, she stayed on that property for 40 years. And these uh, evergreen trees were 40 foot tall, 40 feet tall. And so, uh, Based on my research with the evergreen trees, it took approximately 13 years for those trees to grow 40 feet tall. So they grew at a rate of three feet per year. Now, I don't know if those trees had any sentimental value if Dr. Welsing and her husband planted those trees or uh, what have you, but I can tell you that the trees were there, that she was there before the trees were. And I'm pretty sure that she did watch them grow. And I'm pretty sure that it was stressful to see those trees removed. And then to top it off, once the trees were removed, they didn't put a sound barrier there. So just to give you a better idea of what we're looking at, 
here's Dr. Wilson's house. And here's where the evergreen trees were. Thanks to me grabbing a Google photo that uh, showed, you know, that I was able to take before they changed it. But the playground, they made the playground here. They removed these trees and they never put a buffer zone. So the playground went right up to Dr. Welsing's uh, fence, to, to my understanding. I guess there was a fence or maybe there was no fence at all. Uh, to be honest, based on the information I'm, I'm, I'm collecting here, I don't think there was a fence at all, uh, but let's see. Now, uh, in a... Washington Jewish Week.com article where the director of JPDS, Naomi Reen, right here, was asked about the situation. Naomi Reen's response was they were not mistakenly taken down. She further stated that once the playground area had been surveyed, they determined that the trees would be removed and they notified Dr. Wells. Now, this is in total disregard for the instructions that were given to them by the BZA. You would think that if they felt that the trees needed to be removed, that they would go back to the BZA and get permission to say, hey, look, uh, we, 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 we did a survey, we conducted a survey, uh, and we found out that the trees have to be removed. So uh, what else can we do? Here's a new proposal. But uh, they never did that. So after they removed the trees, it was a group that was mentioned in the article, the Final Call article, that set up this petition for Dr. Welsing. And they were going to give this petition to the council person, Muriel Bowser, who was in charge of the Ward 4 that Dr. Wilson's property was within. They got together, they went out there, they protested at the school, and then they made this, this petition. Oh, this is the name of the group that started the petition. It's called She Shall Not Be Moved. Now, the, uh, the people of that group were quoted to put to say, I, I think I believe I believe I got this quote from the Final Call newspaper article. This is many people have personally witnessed the extreme levels of noise that enters Dr. Welsing's property from the playground, even when all of the windows and doors are closed. Dr. Welsing has to leave her home to escape the noise. There is no other residential home in the District of Columbia where a playground is constructed up to the property line of an adjacent residential home with this same level of noise disturbance. Dr. Wilson is a senior citizen and a highly respected professional who deserves peace and quiet. Now this right here is basically what she said in the Carl Lewis interview uh, that I mentioned earlier. And it says, and I'm quoting Dr. Welsing. I'm saying it really is an equivalent to bullying under the DC human rights law. And I'm also saying that it is the equivalent of a hate crime where one racial group is attacking a member of another racial group, knowing that they are causing great physical harm and could cause death. The playground is in operation five days a week multiple hours per day with a projected plan to have a summer camp next to my home. I notified this school beginning in 2010 when the playground opened that it was negatively impacting my health. At one point, I got a letter back from them essentially saying, too bad, we're sorry, you're sick, but we are in compliance. But they have not been in compliance because initially they were supposed to be 15 feet from my property line and they're 40 feet 
tall trees that were to be left there as a part of a noise buffer, they bulldozed those trees. And I'd like to add that they said in that report, the agreement was that they were going to add some more trees to those trees, which they did not do. So now, what I'm showing you here, I'm going into what a stroke is, basically. And I'm going to do, I'm going to use this based on Dr. Welsing's, you know, words, but I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to demonstrate what a stroke is based on facts, the information that I've collected from various sources on what causes a stroke. Okay. The fact is, I'm going to reiterate it. The fact is that Dr. Welsing was found unconscious in bed and she suffered from two major strokes. Okay, two major strokes. So what is a stroke? It is a brain attack. Cerebral, cerebral vascular disease. It's a cerebral vascular disease. It's a blood clot that stops the flow of blood in the brain. Very, exactly like a heart attack, but only with the brain. It's a blood clot. A heart attack is a blood clot that stops the flow of blood in the heart. Okay, stroke, it's the same thing. Them calling it a stroke, I think, is, you know, just a part of the confusion. They should call it a brain attack. So people could understand that it's the same thing. It's pretty much the same thing. Just different location of the body. Now here, right here, the, the American Heart Association said uh, that high stress, hostility, and depression is linked with increased stroke risk. It says higher levels of stress, hostility, and depressive symptoms are associated with significantly increased risk of stroke or transient ischemic attack in middle age and older adults. I'll reiterate it here. Higher levels of stress are associated with significantly increased risk of stroke in middle age and older adults. Dr. Welsing was approximately 81 years old Then we have Science Daily. It says, how does stress increase risk of stroke and a comma heart attack? Scientists have shown that anger, anxiety, and depression not only affect the functioning of the heart, but also increase the risk for heart disease. Stroke and heart attacks are the end products of progressive damage to blood vessels supplying the heart and the brain. It is thought that persisting stress increases the risk of arterial sclerosis and cardiovascular disease by evoking negative emotions that in turn raise the levels of pro-inflammatory pro -inflammatory chemicals in the body. So this is basically saying persistent stress increases the risk of strokes, okay? Persistent stress, now this, this is what we're looking at here. You know, a lot of stress, the removal of the trees that have been a part of her existence, a part of her property for at least 13 years, gone in a day, not to mention all of the noise, no, no buffer, no 15 foot buffer, just noise, just kids playing, okay? Now here is something from the European Heart Journal. Once again, remember now it says cardiovascular, but let's remember that uh, the same thing that causes heart attacks is the same thing that causes strokes, stress, okay? And right here it says, the role of noise as an environmental pollutant and its impact on health are being increasingly recognized. 
Beyond its effects on the auditory system, noise causes annoyance and disturbs sleep, and it impairs cognitive performance. Furthermore, evidence from epidemiologic studies demonstrates that environmental noise is associated with an increased incidence of arterial hypertension, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Now, now, you know, we, we got these fancy medical terms here, but you're getting at what I'm saying. You're getting at what I'm reading here, right? Both observational experimental studies indicate that in particular nighttime, noise can cause disruptions of sleep structure, vegetative arousals, increases of blood pressure and heart rate, and increases in stress hormone levels and oxidative stress, which in turn may result in endothe endothelial dysfunctional and arterial hypertension this review focuses on the cardiovascular consequences of environmental noise exposure and stresses the importance of noise mitigation strategies for public health I have something else here this is from webmd.com Stress Management Health Center, Stress Linked to Stroke. The Stress Stroke Link. Our findings indicate that people can lower their stroke risk by attempting to reduce the stress in their lives. Did not Dr. Welsing attempt to reduce the stress in her life by trying to get these people to uh, put up a, a noise barrier? but they didn't do it. They totally ignored that. And it says experiencing a major life event over the previous eight months resulting in chronic stress was a strong risk factor for stroke. Now that's, that's eight months, eight months, okay? Having a major life event over the previous eight months resulting in chronic stress was a strong risk factor for stroke. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. From 2010 to 2015, they removed those trees in 2010, did not make any corrections. No noise barrier put up, trees gone, no 15 foot buffer. Dr. Welsing had experienced 60 months, not eight months, 60 months of stress from this major life-changing event. 60 months of noise right up to her property line with no buff. Come on, man. Tell me something. In 1787, I'm told our founding fathers all sat down and wrote a list of principles that's known the world around. The USA was just starting out a whole brand new country. And so our people spelled it out. They wanted a land of liberty. And the preamble goes like this. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution. trying to drive her out of her house they were trying to drive her out of her house and I just want you to know that gentrification is not new it's a term that we've been hearing about uh, for the past what 20 or so years I guess that might be when the term was invented 
But listen what David Walker says in his appeal in 1829. David Walker, by the way, is someone who I believe was the inspiration for Nat Turner and other slave rebellions in the United States, the so-called United States. I quote, I asked those people who treat us so well. Oh, I asked them. He's referring to the racist white supremacists. Where is the most barren spot of land which they have given unto us? Israel had the most fertile land in all Egypt. Need I mention the very notorious fact that I have known a poor man of color who labored night and day to acquire a little money and having acquired it, he vested it in a small piece of land and got him a house erected thereon and having paid for the whole he moved his family into it where he was suffered to remain but nine months when he was cheated out of his property by a white man and driven out the door. And is not this the case generally? Can a man of color buy a piece of land and keep it peaceably? Will not some white man try to get it from him even if it is in a mud hole? I need not comment any further on a subject which all both black and white will readily admit. Of course, this is when racism, white supremacy was out in the open, 1829, okay? But I must really observe that in this very city, when a man of color dies, if he owned any real estate, it must generally fall into the hands of some white person. The wife and children of the deceased may weep and lament if they please, but the estate will be kept snug enough by its white possessors. David Walker, 1829. Now, this right here, I want you to know, th this right here is the cold part, okay? this is the super duper cold part about this whole thing okay three days after dr welsing died the school decided to relocate the program the the playground away from her house isn't that some shit they decided to relocate the playground away from her house three days after she died. She died on January 2nd, 2016. This document right here, January 5th, 2016. This is BZA application. This is the case, 18400A, all right? And right here it says the history this is the history of the document of the uh, of the case and the board approved bza application number 18404 a variance to reduce off-street parking blah 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 okay excuse me it says uh right here number four use of the play area as part of the school's program shall be limited to monday through friday to the hours of eight of 10 a.m to 2.30 and 3.30 to 4.30. That's use of the play area, okay? So this is why all throughout the day she was hearing noise, okay? Well, here, 10. The applicant shall construct a 10-foot high fence along the common lot line with Dr. Welsing's residence as shown on sheets one and two of the plans prepared by whatever, whatever. This was dated on December 12th, 2012. This was never done. They never constructed that fence, okay? Now look down here at the bottom. Conditions three, four, five, six, seven, and 10, uh, 10 and 11. I highlighted it. 
refer to the outdoor play area that is now proposed to be relocated away from Dr. Welsing's residence and are therefore no longer applicable. Now, could this have been a conspiracy to kill Dr. Welsing through stress? I don't know. I think they were trying to drive her off her property and she died and they said, oh shit, we fucked up. We don't even want to buy the house now. We don't even want to take the house now because she, she, she done talked about this. This is what she said was going to happen. So let's back out of this. I, this is why I don't think they intended to kill her. I think they intended to just drive her out. But Dr. Welsing was a very strong person. And just like her, if I bought my property, I would rather die in my property before somebody's going to force me out of it. That's just the way it is. Especially with all of the stuff that we go through in this world where we're constantly relocated and forced to move out and all this gentrification and things are happening. You know, why would you live somewhere for 40 years? Can you imagine 40 years being in a place for 40 years, all the stuff you've accumulated in that house, all the memories you've accumulated in that house and you gotta be forced to leave? Come on, man. So, in conclusion, the administrators of the Jewish Primary Day School, which has now changed its name to the they've changed the name to the I think they call it the Milton Godfrey or Goldstein or somebody like that uh, Primary Day School of Washington D.C. Uh, but it's still there. Nevertheless, it doesn't even matter. That's not the point. Um, I mean, they could have changed the name to, you know, make it seem like they don't exist anymore. I have no idea. To avoid a lawsuit, I, I don't know. But um, the city of Washington, D.C. and the school should be held accountable for the indirect killing of Dr. Wilson. They attempted to drive her out of her house with noise. Dr. Wilson was told by her doctor that if she did not move or get protection from the noise, the stress would cause her to have a heart attack or a brain attack. Dr. Wilson had resided in her house for 40 plus years and did not want to be forced out of her home. I suspect that in their process to drive her out with noise that noise caused her so much stress we're talking about 60 months now the evidence that i presented to you said eight months just eight months of stress could cause you to have a stroke she had 60 months okay so i believe that inevitably killed her JPDS violated an order from the city to comply with providing Dr. Wilson with noise protection. They violated, they violated. The city did not take any constructive enforcement measures to guarantee that Dr. Wilson was not to be mistreated. And this is classic of what happens to us and this is why we are victims of racism, white supremacy. Well, that's it with this report. As I said, if there's anyone out there who's got any, uh, who, who uh, maybe could reach out to Dr. Wilson's doctor, uh, reach out to some of the people who, who protested against this, who posted the petition, anybody out there that was uh, boots on the ground, so to speak, involved in this, please reach out to me. You can email me at counter racism now at gmail.com it's counter racism now at gmail.com matter of fact you can also call me 
707-246-1517. That's 707-246-1517. Okay, this is Dr. Sin Q. Stay strong in the struggle to replace racism, white supremacy with justice. <laughs>